Hello again, this is Matter of Fact, lovely to have your company with us. Well, 10 years since the global financial crisis, tonight we're looking at the threat of a new debt crisis and how that will affect Australia. We'll be discussing that a little bit later. But in Canberra, the aftershocks of the Barnaby Joyce saga continue to be felt less than a fortnight since the Prime Minister spoke of the need to have workplaces that respect women. One of his ministers today threatened to name young women in Bill Shorten's office who are involved in what she described as rumours about the opposition leader, Employment Minister McKayda Cash, made these comments in Senate estimates. Have a listen. I mean, if you want to start discussing staff matters, be very, very careful, because I'm happy to sit here and name every young woman in Mr Shorten's office over which rumours in this place abound. If you want to go down that path today, what? I will do it. <laughs> That's some nonsense. And you, so, well, do you want to start naming them? Do you want to start naming them for Mr Shorten to come out no, and deny Minister, any of the rumours down. that have been circulating this building now for many, and focus many on my questions. years? Well, joining me now is political commentator and professor of politics at the University of Western Australia, Peter Van Onselen. Well, Peter, what did you make of this today? What comes to mind is, what was she thinking? I couldn't agree with you more on that one, Stan. It was her really stepping into a space that she neither needed to nor should have, and she absolutely should have known better. She's a former Minister for Women, and she was representing the Minister for Women in that Senate Estimates hearing. And it's bad at the first level because she's, if you like, buying into rumours and slurs and innuendo. That of itself would be bad enough. But what's so out of line from Michaelia Cash, in my view, on this one, is that she's actually targeting mm. the women here. That is to say, even if the slurs and the rumours that she's referring to had some substance, these are the victims or the potential people on the wrong end of a fiduciary relationship. So at every single level, she was out of line. And I should say this, even Tony Abbott, uh, the former Prime mm. Minister, when she was assisting him in relation to responsibility for women, he has called on her uh, to apologise. Yeah, well, she has walked it back a little bit, hasn't she? She has, but not enough. I mean, she effectively withdrew when Penny Wong, the Leader of the Opposition in the Senate, called on her to do so. Initially, she didn't. Then she withdrew. But it was that sort of, if I've offended anyone, then I apologise and I withdraw. It's sort of the apology when you're not really making an apology. And her office, from what I can see online, is saying that she won't be coming out publicly and issuing some sort of further statement or apology on this. The reason she did it, Stan, in the estimates was mm. because Penny Wong made the point that if you don't, then we need to pursue this more in the chamber. They may do that anyway. Yeah, Peter, is this where we are at now in Canberra after what the Prime Minister had to say and he intervened and said, look, relationships in offices with ministers uh, are out of bounds, but it's opened up a whole discussion about private and, per and, 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 and public and what happens in offices. Is this the, the, the new normal? It, it, look, it's an interesting question because, uh, don't get me wrong, the, the ministerial code of conduct change was probably long overdue, whether you needed it to be formalised or whether the nature of such fiduciary relationships was obvious in the workplace as something that shouldn't happen is a contestable point. But yes, it has opened up, if you like, what could be a Pandora's box uh, in this sort of topic area. But as far as Michaelia Cash goes, uh, she has taken all the wrong reads on this. I can tell you uh, from ministers that I've spoken to today, so not just Liberal MPs but ministers as well, uh, they are absolutely beside themselves that what has been a bad fortnight is yeah. now lingering on because of this misstep by her. Uh, now, she was being questioned over one of her own staff who lost his job because he revealed to, to the media that the police were going to raid the, the AWU offices, the, the Australian Workers' Union offices. And now that has also brought in the Justice Minister. How is he connected to this? Well, that's right. Michael Keenan, uh, he was Justice Minister at the time. Uh, the claim coming from a BuzzFeed journalist uh, who had sourced this, if you like, from another newsroom, was that Michael Keenan office uh, had actually tipped off in relation to that federal police raid. Now, Michael Keenan's office is denying that, but we should bear in mind initially Michaelia Cash's office was denying having done the same thing before ultimately her most senior media advisor falling on his sword and acknowledging that he did, so, did, did do so. Now, that doesn't mean uh, that Michael Keenan's staff have done this uh, as per their denials now, but it just means mm. that there's no doubt that the Labor Party will pursue this. They pursued it in relation to Michaelia Cash. You can bet that they will pursue it in relation to Michael Keenan. He's now, of course, in Cabinet as well. Now, I've got a minute left. We're talking about the aftershocks of the Barnaby Joyce affair and still quite 
questions being raised about the new leader of the Nationals, Michael McCormack, and comments that he's made in the past about gay people. There was one comment in particular in, in, in an editorial that he wrote or an opinion piece he wrote back in 1992. He was a regional newspaper editor. But it turns out what you're referring to, Stan, is that was one of many. Uh, the uncovering of more of what he wrote at the time shows that it wasn't, if you like, an isolated mistake, something that he has since walked back from, but it was part of a very long line of thinking by him. This will raise questions about when did he change his view? Yes, it was a long time ago, but if he was so insistent that he raised raised it time and time again, uh, I wonder how his party feels. There's not been much vetting going on, let's at least put it that way. Yeah, a lot of walls in Parliament and they seem to be just walking into them day <laughs> after day, giving us a, a lot to talk about anyway. Peter, thank you for that. Thanks, Dan. Peter Van Onselen there. Now, remember 10 years ago, the global financial crisis that none of the experts apparently saw coming? Well, the warnings are here that we could be facing a debt crisis again and Australia may be caught up in it. In 2008, few saw it coming. The bigger they are, the more they're gonna fall. They called the banks too big to fail. One by one, they did fall. The government bailed them out. But families with mortgages went to the wall. The contagion spread. The world plunged into what we now call the global financial crisis. But a decade later, the doomsday scenarios are back. Some fear a debt crisis. This time, China may be the big domino to fall. Australia may be toppled in its wake. Economists warn we're carrying too much personal debt. Australians owe almost twice as much as they earn, one of the highest ratios in the world. Interest rates have been low and wages sluggish. It could be a perfect storm. There is some reason for optimism. The IMF says global growth will rise this year. America's economy is performing strongly and there is hope the Trump company tax cuts will wash through to ordinary Americans. The government wants to follow suit here. But China is key. Its economy is still growing, but there is a chorus of naysayers predicting an imminent collapse. So just what will the future hold? Let's discuss this with our panel now. James Lawrenceston is the Deputy Director of the Australia-China Relations Institute at the University of Sydney. Steve Keane is a Professor of Economics at Kingston University. And Pippa Malmgren is an economist and former White House advisor to both Presidents Bush and Obama, walking both sides of the political divide, and is now an advisor to UK Trade Secretary Liam Fox. Lovely to have all of you with us. And Steve, you're the man in the middle, so I want to go to you first. You were one of those who did actually flag that we were potentially going to crisis in 2007, 2008. What makes you think that we are on the precipice again? Well, it's actually regional rather than uh, global this time uh, because America, the UK, Spain, Ireland, a number of other countries went through that crisis back in 2008. And then what the, they're now what I call the walking debt of debt because they're not going to have another boom because mm. their debt levels are still so high and they had a fall back then. The countries had managed to avoid the crisis back then. You mentioned several of them, but China, uh, Australia, Canada, South Korea are the most prominent of those. They continued borrowing private money right through the crisis in various ways. And they're now charged and primed in the same way that America was back in 2000 and eight for a fall in private debt, which we'll call a large fall in demand and give them all the crisis. And now I'll just stay with you for a moment. I want to go to China, the, the question on China in just a sec. But Australia, you mentioned there. Australia, of course, a lot of stimulus at the time, which helped stave off the worst yep. of, of, the, of the recession. And of course, China continued to have a demand for our resources, which helped as well. Why are you concerned specifically about Australia here and the level of Australian personal household debt? Yeah, per Australian personal debt is uh, house household debt, mortgage plus 
unsecured debt is about 122 per cent of GDP now. That's the third highest level uh, recorded in the world, the second highest at the moment, and the highest for any country running a trade deficit. The previous record holder was Ireland. So we've, we, we managed to avoid the crisis by households ladling on more debt, courtesy of what I call the first home vendors boost that encouraged a whole lot of first home buyers to, to borrow much more money and drive up house prices once more. That's what really managed to help Australia evade the crisis, plus some positive stuff like the uh, the $1,000 for everybody with a mm. pulse, uh, the, the bonus and stuff like that. But we evaded it by continuing to, to, to cause, to push the, the causal factor underneath it, which is relying upon personal credit for a major part of our aggregate mm. demand. And when that slows down, when the debt stops rising, the credit can turn negative and that's what causes the recession. Pippa, do you share th these concerns? I have a very different view. I mean, I'm not uh, in favor of high debt levels, household or government, but I have to say I think that there are equal chances that we're on the edge of a big growth period in the mm. world economy. Well, the International Monetary uh, uh, Fund the... is certainly saying that, isn't it? Well, here's the bottom line. The whole purpose of all these governments injecting so much cash into the world economy in their effort to stave off the last crisis is that I think they've created uh, somewhat inflationary conditions. Mm. In other words, the cost of living is starting to go up. And I, when I'm in Australia, you know, you go down to the pub and how much does beer cost in Sydney or Melbourne? It's like $10, $10 these days. <laughs> but everybody says, don't worry, there's no inflation. And I'm like, of course there's inflation. Our data just isn't reflecting it very mm. well. But here's the key thing. If, if inflation has begun, which I think it absolutely has in the West, and it's definitely present in China, then all the investors can't stay in cash anymore because you get killed in cash. And they start to go into the real economy, either equities or real economy investments. Mm. And I think this is partly what's pushed the stock markets globally to record all-time highs. It's not a great story in the longer run, but in the near term, inflation is actually quite good for growth and markets. Yeah, in the near term, and I, I want to come back to what the longer term uh, uh, you know, outlook will be, but James, when we talk about this problem with debt, China is, is front and centre here. And a lot of the concern is not that China is carrying debt that it can't, it can't meet at the moment, but it has run up that debt so quickly. Yeah, that's exactly right, Stan. So the, the, every country has their own debt challenges, but I guess the reason why China's a bit special is because it's central to the global debt story. Mm. Um, so if you look at China over the last five years, it's accounted for nearly two-thirds of the increase in, in global debt. Um, and at the same time, it's been responsible for about 35 40% of world GDP growth. Um, so you put those two together, and if something goes wrong with the debt in China, then suddenly you've got a global growth problem as well. Now, we know that the collapse of China, James, has been forecast for the past 20 years, and it still hasn't happened yet. But when you look at, at what's underlying here, China needs to keep its economy growing. But can it just rely on credit and debt to maintain that growth? I saw one figure where it's costing China upwards of 6 or $7 in debt to create a dollar of growth. Yeah, right. Um, look, some good news over the last year. China's debt as a proportion of its economy has actually stabilised over the 12 months. Um, so I think there's some, there's some good signs there. Look, the other thing is Australia's debt story and China's debt story are quite different. Um, China's debt is coming from a low base. So mm. even though it's risen rapidly, it's still a long way behind the likes of Japan. Um, it's also mostly corporate debt rather than household debt. Um, corporate debt's got its own challenges. Uh, but one good thing is it's usually backed by some assets. And finally, don't forget China's economy is still growing at nearly 7%. Yeah. Um, that doesn't hurt. So they tell us, and I know there's some scepticism about, about those numbers. I saw you nod your head there, Steve, and I, I'm, I'm suspecting that you're not as sanguine about China's economic outlook as perhaps James is. Well, for different reasons. I, I think China will be able to do a, a much, much faster flip from relying upon credit to rely, relying upon government spending because they don't have the obsession, nonsense obsession the West has with running government surpluses. And I've been told by, by people who know Chinese stats fairly well, they claim that at the moment the level of government spending in excess of government taxation is running at about 15% of GDP. Now, that's one and a half times the size of the Obama stimulus that slowed down the decline in America. And it's before the decline has really begun. And I also see the Silk Road project as being a major idea of trying to continue boosting demand in China. So because it's a command economy as much as it is a capitalist one, 
they can switch out of this much, much more rapidly. But they still will have a slowdown in credit. Uh, and Pippa, where do you sit on China? We know the distinction here between what is private debt, household debt that Steve's very worried about, particularly in places like Australia, and the corporate debt that James thinks that China can live with because it is continuing to grow. Where do you sit? So I think there is no more China. China mm. is no longer just its own country. What it is is part of a global network. And this Belt and Road Initiative that was mentioned earlier, the Silk Road Project, is all about building the largest infrastructure build out in modern history, bridges, roads, highways, ports, airports, all over the world that will connect China to the world. and tighten the supply chains into that economy and create markets for their goods. So there, there is no more China in the sense that, uh, that people think about it in the past. It's a global China. So we can't think about our, their GDP in the same way that we used to. It's mm. a much bigger story. And that story is growing. And James, we saw concern a couple of years ago on the China stock market, didn't we? And there was a collapse there and that really made people nervous. A couple of weeks ago, and Pippa mentioned inflation on the rise and concern about rising inflation. There was concern in the US that may see an uptick uh, in interest rates once again. And we saw the markets get nervous again. If you add all of these things together, what sort of scenario are we looking at here? Look, Stan, I can't help but be pretty confident for the rest, for the rest of 2018. Um, Two-thirds of China's growth last year came from consumption spending. Um, consumer confidence in China right now is at record highs or at least multi-year highs. And if you look at indicators of business activity as well, whether it's government ones or unofficial ones, they're looking pretty good as well. Mm. So I'm pretty confident for 2018. Um, we could talk about the longer run, yeah. but the near term I think is pretty solid. And, and Steve, it's a high wire act, isn't it, China? And I suppose, look, all... All discussion comes back to China because, as Pippa said, it's not just China anymore. It's, it's part of the, one of the lungs, if you like, of, of the global economy. But it's a high-wire act. They've, they're making the transition from export and investment to a consumption-based economy as it matures. Where do you see them in terms of being able to make that transition, given that there is still so much debt, a reliance on credit, mm -hmm. they've built these huge ghost cities. I've seen them. I've driven through them. Office towers yep. and apartment blocks where no one is living or working in. How do you see that? A lot of that is waste. You're quite right. But at the same time, uh, China is capable of harnessing its monetary system and causing a huge amount of production to be generated, whether that's worthwhile or not worthwhile. And like I've, I've seen in the same sorts of towers. I know exactly what you're talking about there. But at the same time, they're building high-speed rail that would be the envy of anything in America, uh, certainly in the UK where I am. Uh, so there's a huge amount of, of genuine infrastructure and genuine industrialization going on there and a lot of entrepreneurial activity as well. And when corporate debt is, is a problem, corporations do go bankrupt. And then when they go bankrupt, mm. you can't chase them for the money anymore. When households go bankrupt, they don't cease existing and they continue being pushed down and they can't consume. So in terms of having a debt trap, I'd rather have a corporate one than a private one. And again, of course, in China, a lot of that corporate debt is actually government-owned debt and they can write it off. Yeah, they can. Um, and they've improved incredibly resilient over the, over the past you know, two decades. Pippa, something you said mm. that really caught my eye, and that is that you make the connection between debt and the social contract that debt damages the social contract. And if you're advising, you know, the, the government there in, in Great Britain, we're seeing Brexit, of course, playing out. And you've said populism, Brexit, the, elect the election of Donald Trump, is fuelled by, by this problem of debt. I think that's right. I think of the debt kind of as a silent wrecking ball that just bears down on the social fabric and the promises that hold the society together. Because you can't, uh, for example, people have to retire later than mm. you had expected because the debt is so great. So, yeah, we do have to address the debt. But the question is how to do it. And really, the best way to do it is by growing faster. But, 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 that, but does growing faster require more debt to keep growing faster? <laughs> I don't think it does, and I don't think it should, and I think Steve there are does. ways you Steve's can innovate without doing it. <laughs> Steve, you're nodding your head there, again. <laughs> but here's the key thing. 
there are places to pay attention to, and I think the U.S. and Mexico are the two that everybody should be keeping an eye on in terms of how to grow faster. Mexico is now cheaper than China when it comes to wages. Mm. It's competitive with China on an incredible scale. The U.S. is growing strongly. You know, if I were Australia, I would be saying, why is the country doing so much but to trade with only China? It should also mm. be trading with the U.K., with the United States, with Mexico, and that growth would help diminish the debt issue. Yeah, I, I, I'll hold your thoughts, Steve. I'm going to finish with you in just a, in just a moment. But, James, the, the whole idea of social cohesion, debt and the economy, nowhere would that be more critical than China because if the engine stops running and, and if, if you do see a debt crisis, that has political implications. Up, that, that really challenges the entire society. Oh, indeed it does. And look, just because China's not a democracy, it doesn't mean the government's not under pressure. In fact, it probably means it's under more pressure uh, because it, it can't claim, claim legitimacy through open elections. So it has to point to um, increased living standards. Um, and in the big cities in China, it is not easy to get a house these days. Um, so that's a big central challenge for the Chinese government. But again, I think that's actually one reason I'm pretty confident. Uh, because the government's under a lot of pressure, they have to deliver. And I think there's one thing I've learned from studying the Chinese economy over the last 20 years is that the government's pragmatic. That is, in the end, it does what it has to do to keep growth going. It also relies on nationalism, doesn't it? And if it's pushed to the mm. wall, if there is a concern about a pending collapse, would we see that, and that could be very dangerous, rising to the surface? Yeah, look, I think the Chinese government would get involved a long time before we got to that level. As I said before, things aren't bad at the moment. Consumer confidence is at mm. multi-year highs. Um, so I still still think we're away from that point yet at the moment. Steve, OK, you've been nodding your head and you've been, you know, making all sorts of noises there. Um, respond to that idea that, that you, you grow yep. your way out of debt and then a, and then a thought yeah. from you on what a debt crisis will look like. Yeah, um, you, your program's got a subtitle when, when knowledge matters more than opinion. And <laughs> uh, one of my good colleagues, Richard Vaig, who's a, a billionaire philanthropist in America, uh, commissioned research into the 150 debt crises that have occurred in the last one and a half centuries and found that in none of them did the countries actually grow out of it, except when they had an enormous expelled surplus with countries like Saudi Arabia at various times. It doesn't happen. The way you get out of a debt crisis is you write the debt off. You have to write the debt down, and the government can do that by what I call a modern debt jubilee. It could be mm. done actually fairly easily, but otherwise it's going to be there and it's going to be a, a, you know, a chain uh, around the ankle permanently. And, 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 Steve, when you talk about a debt crisis and the one you see coming that will hit Australia, give us in about 30 seconds what that is going to look like for ordinary people. A large fall in demand in the economy because suddenly you can't use your credit card to go shopping anymore. You're paying a credit card off and demand drops off in, in Main Street. Uh, and that then also initially causes a large fall in house prices, which is where we use most of our credit card purchases for. That is the trigger, the beginning of a downturn in demand, large increase in unemployment. But I guarantee Malcolm Turnbull will be back in there trying to pump up the housing market, and that indirectly will cause a bit of a recovery, but we'll still go through a serious slump. And Pippa, I, I read that in 2007 you did see things coming. You sold your house. You decided to rent, so you'd be the person here. I know that you're a little bit more optimistic about not falling into a, into a going over the debt cliff, but you'd be someone to advise people about what to start to do if there is a, a problem pending and we are carrying too much personal debt and the signs are there, what do you do? I think the key is every individual needs to assess their own situation. If they're not earning enough to pay for the life they have, then adjustments got to be made. Everybody needs to invest in their own personal skill sets to improve their ability to earn cash flow. And uh, so permanent lifetime education is now on the table. That's not a, just an idea for the future. That's something you should be doing now. So I think instead of worrying about it collectively, the most important thing is to think about it individually. And, and I would just add in one last thing, mm. which is, yeah. you know, the Industrial Revolution happened in the aftermath of a record debt crisis. And I agree, that was written off at that time, and we are going to see write-offs in debt. We're seeing them right now in the U.S. pension funds, for example. But it's different from a sudden announcement one day that the government just says we're defaulting on our debt. That's how Argentina does it, but it's mm. not how Australia does it. In the meantime, the main thing is look at your own household and 
get your affairs as much in order as you possibly can. Yeah, and as the IMF says, the global economy could be growing around, you know, almost 4% this year. But I also know that there's over $200 trillion of debt. Does debt fuel growth? That's the question we started with and that's the one we, we, we finish off with. Lovely to talk to you all. Pippa, Steve, James, terrific. Thank you so much for joining us. So there was uh, Craig Emerson, who was Trade Minister in Australia, was someone who actually had his hands on the economy and the future for Australian finance at one point. He was a minister in the Gillard Labor government, a former advisor to Bob Hawke. He's just published his memoir. It's called The Boy from Baradine. You might not know that town. I do. And there is a very personal connection between Craig and I. I spoke to him earlier. Craig Emerson, lovely to have you on the program and to see you again. Y your book's called The Boy from Baradine and I suppose we're both boys from Baradine in a way, aren't well, we? Well, that's right. You know all about <laughs> Baradine. You <laughs> used to turn up three door two doors down. Two doors down. Yes, people wouldn't realise that. You know, we're sitting here having this conversation all these years later and our lives, yep. you know, going back to, to childhood in Baradine. In Baradine. Tell us about... I mean, I know about it, but tell people about Baradine. Uh, it's in northwest New South Wales near Coonabarabran and the Siding Springs Observatory. Most people know of the big telescope. Uh, it's wheat sheep territory in those days. Uh, it was a timber town. Mm. Still is. On, to on the edge of the Pilliga. On Pilliga the edge scrub. of the Pilliga forest. And that um, grows cypress pine. So when people look at their floorboards with that knotted uh, look, the, that's cypress pine. And the real attraction of it is termites hated it. White mm. ants hated it. Uh, cypress pine, so it was really good building material. But our houses weren't really built out of no, cypress they, pine. They, I, I hear Barnaby Joyce talking about, you know, the, the what is it, the, the weatherboard, and weatherboard and iron. Ours yeah. were five, five row and tin. tin. <laughs> <laughs> we couldn't afford no, weatherboard. No, we couldn't and afford. <laughs> and, and I remember, you know, when, when we were boys, and as you say, you know, my grandfather's house is two yeah. doors down from, from where you were, and straight across in the football oval. That's right. Remember the cat heads that would stick in oh, our yeah, feet, yeah. those horrible You, you couldn't things. see them, but, oh, and <laughs> they'd go in, and then maybe the little bit would break off in your foot too, and then oh, you'd have you'd to get the needle to dig them out. burning in your yeah, feet. Yeah. And, and, you know, when I think back about that, they're really idyllic years because it's our childhood, yeah. and those little towns are almost a thing of the past in Australia, but they weren't... They were maybe idyllic to us on the surface, yeah. but there was a lot of darkness, wasn't there? Oh, there was. And in our household, as I relay in the book for the first time, really, there was some real violence, all on my mother's side, actually. Um, Mum, I think now, looking back on it, was profoundly depressed. But as little kids, we didn't know what depression was. I don't think Mum knew what depression was. She just would get into these very, very bad moods. Mm -hmm. And so she'd hit us and she um, would take sleeping pills, I think, just to relieve the pressure and um, did try to take her life a few well, you times. you talk about that in the book. Your Pretty father calling you up and kids. saying, Pud, as they called yeah, you, Pud you know, head. Um, that you need to come home because yeah. your mum tried to kill so herself. So mum had had this real big episode with me. I didn't know what I'd done wrong. She locked herself in the bedroom and took sleeping tablets in there. And I, I was about four, 15, I think, 14, 15. And I thought, I, I can't take this anymore. And two friends and I, three, had built this tree house, three-storey tree house about two kilometres out of town. So I left and mm. went to the tree house, stayed there all through the evening and then slept there. And then the... Middle of the night, it must have been about 11 or 12 actually, I could hear this voice, my father's voice across the creek, Pud, Pud, you better come. Mum's trying to knock herself off and wow. off I go. She had taken sleeping pills and we were to go to the hospital where she'd been taken and then she was transferred to Kennebarabran Hospital in a bigger town and she survived but, mm. yeah, it's pretty... And traumatic damage, yeah. damage. Yeah. And, and your dad as well. Your dad had had a, a hard life. You talk about yep. him that he'd had the spirit beaten out of him. Really. Yeah, his dad was violent. Uh, I used to say to my cousin, poor little bugger, poor little Ernie, uh, for some reason his father really, you know, focused his violence on one of the four children, two girls, two boys, and dad copped it, often copped the um, buckle end of a belt. And I'm sure for no obvious reason to little kids. This is what's so perplexing about domestic violence mm. against kids, you know, child abuse. Usually they can't, they've got no understanding of why they're being beaten and there usually is no good reason and no explanation. And I think that's more 
um, tort you know, torturing yeah. than the physical assault. What have I done wrong to deserve this? And this is going on in you know in all of our families. We're going on in my family, all in the same in the same town. And often people didn't necessarily even know what was. They sat didn't in know. That and I believe that in that town and in all towns, and probably in Sydney and Melbourne, there was an S, an approach which said, "What goes on behind closed doors mm. stays behind closed doors. It's not our business." It's, We've made good progress since then, by the way. It's really damaging, though, isn't it? Oh, and, it is. and you carried that, and you rely in the book the time that you you tried to take your own. Yeah, life. I just uh, ask people to maybe they've ever if they've ever experienced this when there, there's just nothing in life for you. You're so despairing, and it wasn't you know like a a protest or anything, I just could see no way out, no future. I couldn't see growing up and getting out of it. It was my whole world, this world of random violence. But something stopped you. And it was my Catholic education, you said, we knew the football ground. Well, mm. immediately across from that was yeah. Little St John's Convent. And the, nur uh, the uh, nuns had absolutely um, engendered in us um, Christianity and a terrible fear of hell. And if you commit suicide, particularly under those uh, terms, I don't know if in the modern day teaching that's a mortal sin, you go straight to hell. So, um, you know, this is the proposition. Mm. I'm kind of living a hell, uh, hell on earth and then destined for the real one. What changed then, Craig, to take a boy from Baradine and you end up studying economics, you end yep. up becoming a government advisor, you work for the Prime Minister, Bob Hawke, and then you go into Parliament and you become a minister. That is an extraordinary trajectory. Well, I think it would not have been possible if I had ever believed that my mother hated me, that didn't, my mother did not love me. I always believed that my mother loved me. And I've talked to um, professionals, not in, in my situation, but I set up a group when I first went into Parliament called uh, Parliamentarians Against Child Abuse. And you talk to the professionals, and this is a very big difference. If a child believes that that child was unwanted, is a burden on the parents and so on, and that can be conveyed to them, that's devastating. That was never conveyed to me. It's amazing how valuable some support is. The nuns provided me support. That convent school was like a refuge. When I was at that school, I was safe and I was happy and I loved learning because it was a good mm. place to be. Um, and then later in life, uh, there would be other people who would just say, well, have a look at this young Emerson. He's worth having a look at. And you get that encouragement. When I came from Baradine to the city, when Dad lost his job in the department store, Permuan Rights, mm. or Permuans as it then was, mm. Um, I thought, I can't compete against these kids at St Patrick's College at Strathfield. They're really smart, they're brainy. And I, I kind of did OK. I wasn't one of the best students. Then I did, however, get into economics at Sydney Uni. I, thought, I can't compete <laughs> with these <laughs> well, kids. You, you more than competed. You became trade minister. Yeah, yeah. So what, what was that like, Craig? I mean, to move forward to that point where you get that phone call and you're going to be Trade Minister of Australia. And that was even better than being told by Julia Gillard um, after uh, Labor had just won the 2010 election that I was going to be a Cabinet Minister. Because we talked about football and so yeah, on. Yeah. Really, I'm playing for Australia. I just <laughs> got picked for Australia. <laughs> Selected for Australia. <laughs> that, that's how you I'm felt. Australia's trade minister. You know, I could have been the minister for home affairs, or I could but have been this the was minister the for social job. security. I was the minister representing Australia in lots of international forums. Craig, Craig you, you mentioned Julia Gillard, and you know, I don't want to get into too much personal stuff here. This is, you know, you do talk about it in the book, but sure. talking about it and writing about it, the different things. Yeah. I, I understand that you did have a, a, a relationship, and yeah. again, that's let's put that to one side, but. When you look at what we've seen the past couple of weeks with the, the Barnaby Joyce saga and the Prime Minister putting bans on relationships mm. between staffers and ministers and reflecting on your own personal situation yeah. as it was back then and your relationship, how do you see the way that things have changed politically well, with the private and the public? Not, not profoundly. Uh, there's a, a, an unwritten rule. It might as well be in writing because it's pretty assiduously followed in Parliament House in Canberra and that is private lives are matters for private individuals, unless it affects your discharge of responsibilities as, say, a minister, mm. or unless it involves the abuse of taxpayers' money. Mm. And that's where 
things started to get a bit, you know, there were questions asked about Barnaby Joyce in those respects. And I think if the, none of those questions arose, it probably wouldn't have amounted to much, to be honest. Mm. Just finally, when you look at that life and the boy from Baradine, you've spoken about your family and what they went through. How does it feel to be sitting here and look back on those achievements and think back to those times and how your family must feel about you now? Well, Dad was really... They're both very, very proud. I got appointed to the United Nations in Bangkok when I was 23 and my dear old Dad, who wasn't, you know, a very wordy sort of guy and mm. he was very shy, he just wrote this lovely letter to say how proud he was of me, you know, kind of representing the Emerson family and representing Australia again in the United Nations. So I guess my message, having met world leaders and people are just people, yeah. you know, when you meet these people and they're so famous and everything else, they'll start talking about their kids or their mother or their father or something pretty soon. And that's probably the most illuminating observation I can make through my journey through life. I'm just a person like you are, you know, at the Sutherland's place, <laughs> down on the corner, getting catheads in our feet yeah, and going and watching the footy. We don't travel too far from Baradine. That's good, right. good to talk to you, Craig. Thanks, Thank Dan. you. Remember Bill Clinton when he said that he didn't inhale even though he'd tried marijuana? Well, a lot of Australians go one better than that. They do admit that they have used it, about one in three adults. But we're not here to talk about recreational cannabis. We're here to talk about medicinal cannabis. It has been legal for a couple of years, but just how difficult is it to be prescribed and what is it used for? Brad Mackay is here for our regular health chat. So let's talk about the difference between what we commonly know as marijuana, recreational, and this medicinal cannabis. Yeah, so all, all of us sort of have heard of recreational cannabis. Um, we've got about... A one in three have tried it, apparently. One in three have tried it. We've got about a million people, um, a million Australians who are using it on a weekly basis. Mm -hmm. These are rough estimates, of course. Um, but, yeah, it's sort of known to cause a high or a euphoric effect. So what's but the difference if we're talking about medicinal that doesn't have the same qualities? Yeah, so a lot of people who are wanting medicinal cannabis, they're not wanting that high effect. They're wanting it for other health benefits. So we, we typically use it for a whole range of different conditions. So, um, so you won't get a high? Has, has, the, has something been, it's, it's been modified, has it? Well, the, the whole thing about medicinal cannabis is rather than getting a leaf and drying it and then smoking it, um, you don't really know what dose you're going to get. So if you've got medicinal cannabis and you've got two, two main chemicals, CBD and THC, um, these are chemicals that are purified, they're extracted, and then we know what dose you're going to get with every drop that mm -hmm. you're taking. So it's a, a lot more um, dignified, a lot more refined. Um, you're not smoking it, and it's usually had as uh, oil drops that you put under your tongue. So, and and what, what's it used for? What, what, what sort of illnesses would be best su suited to this? Yeah, so there's a wide range of, of uses for it. So CBD or cannabidiol, if we're just using it 100% CBD, we'll often use that for kids. So there, there's no um, addictive potential for it. There's no psychoactivity for it. It's not going to make the kids high. Um, and it's very, very good at uh, decreasing down seizures, for particularly for kids that have, have intractable epilepsy. Mm. We've tried every other treatment under the sun and nothing's left. This is another option that a lot of parents are turning to. So other things we use it for are for cancer patients, particularly cancer pain. Um, also, if people are throwing up their guts from uh, chemotherapy, um, it's fantastic for chemotherapy-induced nausea, um, but even for multiple sclerosis patients as well, for pain and spasticity. So is that what it is about? Is about regulating pain? Basically, is that, is that the main effect? Yeah, so if we're using a combination of THC, the tetrahydrocannabidol, um, and CBD as well, that could be quite beneficial for, for chronic pain, particularly mm. neuralgic pain. Does it work? Is the, is the jury still out on the effectiveness? Yeah, if you've, if you've got about five doctors in a room, you'll get ten <laughs> opinions. So this is what we're debating at the moment. Certainly there's, there's a number of, like, of clear, clear evidence that, that it works for a number of different conditions, and now we're sort of like fighting over some of the finer points. There are some specialists and GPs and, and, uh, and doctors who are saying that it doesn't do anything, we shouldn't have it at all. You've got other people on the other ex extreme. So we've got hippies that are on the central coast that are saying that it cures everything, including cancer. So science is really finding that it's in the middle. So we don't say that it's really curing anything, but it can make life a lot easier for a lot of people who are sick.
Is there a concern about side effects? I think I was reading somewhere where there may be some concern about impact on the liver and potentially mental illness as well? Yeah, so for, for some of the kids that have been in trials in Australia using just CBD, um, we're finding that some of the, the children have abnormal liver function tests and sometimes we do need to stop the medication. So we, we're needing to sort of monitor that over time. But it can also interact with other medications and if your child's on other anti-epileptic medication, those can cause liver function problems as well. Mm -hmm. And so it, it's a bit of a fine tune of, of trying to make all the medication work together. What about schizophrenia? I had heard, you know, talk about that in the past. Has that been, has that link been proven? Yeah, so it can certainly cause hallucinations as a, as a, as a temporary measure. Uh, a lot of people have blamed psychosis or schizophrenia on marijuana use or cannabis use. What we sort of understand at the moment is that it may be that people actually have a, a genetic predisposition for developing schizophrenia, right. but it can be the THC component that's bringing it out a little bit earlier than what it otherwise would have happened. So it's not... 100% yeah. safe. Um, the estimates are that you'd need about 2,000 people to, to use cannabis for one person to, to develop schizophrenia or psychosis. And take us through the legalities of this now. So it has been, you know, legal so, uh, for the past couple of years, but that doesn't necessarily mean easy to get. Yeah, you can't quite walk into your general practitioner and ask for a prescription for it. Um, I can't dish it out straight away. Um, I, as a GP, I need to have a specialist opinion to, to say that it's safe to use in this patient. Uh, you've got to apply to a federal level with the TGA. You've also got to apply to your local state as well. Um, there are forms to fill out. They send it back. There's lots of questions. Mm. Um, the paperwork is quite quite a lot. You've got multiple um, doctors that you need to see to have it finally approved. And I've had some patients who might say, look, that's just too complicated. So what are, are they going to the, you know, the, the street corner, if you like, the, the black market to buy it? Yeah, well, well, this is my concern. And then that's so, not treated in the same way. It's not, you know, it's not used in the same way. The safeguards necessarily aren't there. Yeah, totally. So if we're putting all of these barriers up, and Australia has some of the most convoluted, um, high hurdles to actually battle through to get access to medicinal cannabis. And what it is, is it's creating all of these high hurdles. Um, we're trying to be restrictive with it, but I, in my opinion, I think that we're being too restrictive mm -hmm. with it. So it is driving people to go to the black market. They're finding that it's much easier to walk down to the train station, um, Granny can find somebody who's wearing a leather jacket and then uh, ask them about cannabis. They're buying it from the street corner. And so, and they often won't even tell their doctors that, as the well. Safety concerns and yeah. what, we, we what you're We don't know what using. they're getting. Yeah. They're more likely to get a high THC dose, so they're more likely to get stoned from mm. using that as well compared to lower doses that we, that we use in medicinal cannabis. And uh, yeah, often people won't tell their doctors as well. So we've got no idea what people are having. We can't monitor what they're using. So you would like to be in a position where you can Describe that much more, much more easily. Yeah, I, I think if, if people are finding that it's too hard, there's too much paperwork, the hurdles are too high, and they're missing out on a on a medication that could be beneficial for them, uh, I, I think that's a tragedy. And I, I think that we should be allowing patients to have more of a choice. Uh, we need cheaper availability, um, yeah, less less red tape, um, and yeah, not not picking on sick people that are, are trying to get some help genuinely. Yeah, good to talk to you, Brad. Thank you for that. Same here. That's our program for tonight. Hope you can join us again tomorrow. I'll see you then.